I'd like to thank the Friends of the Library for making this program possible. I'd also like to thank Vera Bookstore, who's here tonight selling lots of books. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah, has they come without all these books. <laughs> um, and let's see, make sure you turn off your cell phones because that would not be good. With that, that's good for ladies. And at the end of the program, just stay in your seats until you get down to the signing table. Yeah. <laughs> and you have excuse me, Deb Perlman is the author of two best selling cookbooks. And is one and sorry, and is one of the internet's most successful food bloggers. Smitten Kitchen Keepers is her third cookbook. A self-taught cook and photographer, Deb tests her recipes in a tiny kitchen for act for accuracy, and not a single bowl is wasted, and the results are always worth the effort. Her award-winning blog, smittenkitchen.com. Is a homegrown brand that now has more than one million followers. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. She lives in New York City with her husband and two adorable children. <laughs> um, and she, she has been, last month she's had some um, flu, and she got better for us. Case <laughs> <laughs> Berger. Is a freelance writer, interviewer, and the marketing and event director of Barrett Bookstore, Marianne. She has worked in, with the Darren Library on a number of author events, and we are so happy to have her with us tonight. She also she lives in Darien with her family. So, welcome, ladies, and get the show on the road. Again. We haven't been given mic instructions, so, you, you wonderful people of the Darien Library, if you can't hear us, I want us to just, we're good? Are we holding or we're just? You want us to grab them? Okay, so I can help kind of a There we go. Obviously, Mark, here. I was going to say, that's way more for the mic than I am. Um, first of all, thank you to the Darien Library. Thank you to the friends of the Darien Library. I know they're integral in bringing these programming, um, this programming to Darien. And as always, Vera Bookstore, so please to partner with them. And Deb, Thank you for hopping on Metro North. <laughs> She's glad you're here. Shouldn't take a car service, people. She gets on the Metro North. And, and, when, and when I offered to pick her up at this station, she said, no, why, why would you pick me at the station? I will walk. And indeed, she did. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I was like, you have sidewalks, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, Deb, you and I go way back, like really way back. You don't know how far back we go, though, okay. because we did have a really fun conversation during lockdown with our good friends Jacques oh and yes. Melissa Clark. <laughs> Some of you may have been with us at that very intimate, charming event. Um, but we go back to um, what I like to call my entree into adult cooking which is your oven roasted ribs in the tin foil. My mom didn't make ribs growing up, and so that was like the first real recipe that I was able to execute flawlessly thanks to you. But what I would like to know is what is your origin story with food is. So we're gonna go all the way back. You grew up in New Jersey, right? I grew up in New Jersey. Okay. Um, and what did food look like when you were a kid in your house? It was pretty normal. Like, you know, chicken, cereal for breakfast, vegetables. We had salad with dinner every night. I think that was like, it was fairly normal. Nobody was too crazy with the experiment thing. I think the craziest thing is that my mom tried, she taught herself to cook from mastering the art of French cooking. She liked Julia Child. She saw her on TV and she just liked it. So she definitely taught herself like beef bourguignon and like French onion soup. They were still like company meals. We weren't having it on a Tuesday, much to <laughs> everyone's disappointment. <laughs> but so your mom was, you know, she was invested in learning. And so you did you see, you saw that as a child, sort of as a model? Definitely so saw, yeah. I mean, she's, I, <laughs> she's like, I'm just a cook, you know, it wasn't anything too crazy. But I definitely did not think that you needed to be scared of a recipe. Like, I didn't think that you needed to have special skills to make a recipe. Like I thought you should just be able to follow the recipe and make sense of it. Okay. 
So fast forward, you you know grow up, you move to New York City, and you start a blog. The blog is not Smitten Kitchen. The blog is Smitten, right? <laughs> yes. And I know, let me just say, I know, and I, I will admit to watching your interview with Emma Straub, and I learned something about Deb's fans, which I know we have a lot of in this room. <laughs> is this a friend? Are you the friend? In the of it? This is amazing. <laughs> Would you like to tell everyone what the friends of Deb call no. all you people here? Deb heads. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know that before. You are now a Deb head. Um, anyway, she also says the true Deb heads come to every event, so this is her second one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's all the teachers from her own Thank you. <laughs> so, but before you had Deb Heads, you started this blog called Smith. And for those of us who weren't familiar with that, can you talk a little bit about the origin of that? Sure. Um, the year was 2003. Or Alfred, I keep boring you. Um, I just started a blog because I wanted to tell stories and I was going on a lot of bad dates and <laughs> I like to talk about New York and I just I don't know, I like to tell stories. So that was it in 2003. You didn't need to have like a social media strategy or like <laughs> hashtags or any kind of like <laughs> philosophy. You could just actually have a URL and write. So that's what I did. Um, unfortunately, or for, I guess I should probably call it fortunate. Um, I did not date for very long because my husband was reading my whole future. He wasn't my husband yet. Because that would also be very awkward. But I went on a date with him probably about a month or two months into it. So I couldn't, you know, we were together and we got married a couple years later. So there wasn't really wasn't much dating talk after that. Um, and uh, I just got more and more into cooking. It was never not about cooking. It just wasn't the primary focus. And I realized a couple of years in, that was all I really wanted to talk about. And I actually, it was a little bit of a kamikaze mission because I was just thinking that was going to be the end of it. Like, we need to bring this run to the end. I did not think that anybody was going to read a site about cooking from somebody who was like, I kind of just figured out what this button on my oven does. <laughs> um, and that's where I really was. I was like very much a beginning cook. Um, and I didn't think anybody would read that, so I figured it would last six months and then I'd go and figure out what I was going to actually do with my life. Um, that's not what happens. That's not what happens. So fast forward, we're sitting here in 2022, and I promise we are going to talk a lot about this book in my life. But I'm so curious now, you obviously had incredible success and continue to have incredible success with Smitten Kitchen in its blog form. Now comes in social media of all types. You know, we start with sort of photos and some tags, and now we've got the videos and the TikTok, which you yeah, guys have. you done any TikTok dances? Well, here's the thing it's, <laughs> it's bad. It's bad. My son is like, Mom, you gotta outsource this. We have an Instagram account at Barrett, and but like TikTok for booksellers, it's a thing, just like it is for food. Deb is a pro, so if you, you do offer private tutoring, we're over it. But if you guys haven't, if you're not on TikTok and you're not watching your videos, you absolutely should because they're masterful. So with all these different pieces of content, you have cookbooks, you have blog, you have TikTok, you have all these, what's your favorite? What do you love to do when you're sharing your love of food and cooking with people? Whatever I'm in the mood to that day, that's the real freedom. <laughs> Just figuring out what I want to do. So when there's a new recipe, like I, I like talking about it, and I don't want to talk about another recipe. So I like being able to kind of jump my intention span around. Where sometimes I can make videos, sometimes I can be recipe testing, sometimes I can be. So I like that I get to hop around a little bit. But there are a lot of pieces these days that were not there in 2006 for sure. Oh, it keeps it interesting. Um, the new book, Smitten Kitchen Keepers. You guys, you're not going to send the booksellers home with any. I know that because Deb would be so disappointed if she walks out and sees a full table. Um, but as evidenced by the yellow stickies, we've started cooking a lot from this in my household. And I'd love to hear. So this is your third cookbook. Mm -hmm. And I heard um, that your dad, who has since passed, um, said to you, did it happen when you got your first cookbook deal that you were going to write three? 
Is this a true story? No. How does that how does that fit into it? Was, I think it was around the time. I think he loved the words three book deal. And I was like, I'm not doing a three book deal that because I'm not doing that. I have this huge fear of commitment. And I believe I was absolutely correct in being afraid of commitment. Like, could you imagine like finishing like this giant book tour and all of this stuff and having to like immediately finish a manuscript for the next book like that sounds horrible I have no regrets over not doing a multi-book deal so each one has been individually pitched and negotiated due to my fear of commitment but um, I also like the freedom that nobody can tell me what schedule to be on well except for when I sign a contract and I tell people I'm going to deliver the manuscript at a certain date and they ask me where it is I'm like why are you bothering me <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very mature um, but he loved he loved to read book deal and when I finished the second book he was like when are you writing the third book and I'm like I just finished a book can I just just stop I feel like we're good we're good we wrote two we're good this is exhausting it's a lot of work I don't want to do it anymore um but 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 here we are here we are <laughs> awesome. I want I knew I wanted to come at it with different energy um from the first two books Okay, and explain that because I have to say, I mean, I your first two books are well worn in my household. Everything, those biscuits, you know, the seasoning before like everyone was doing everything. It's so good, sure, snap you me so salad. I mean, there's so many good things, but this this does feel a little different to me, even in the narrative and reading through. So, can you share with people who haven't gotten a chance to crack it open yet? Well, it's really awkward, yeah. and I'm not supposed to say this, but it's my favorite. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm really glad that I. <laughs> that that the first two were so well received, but I feel like I felt like something just clicked with this book, where I felt like I finally understood what I was supposed to be doing, which is very weird because it's my third book. Like, what were you doing with the first two? But I feel like I was a little bit more. I there's a lot of amazing recipes in them, and I'm very happy, and I'm so glad that they're part of people's homes and repertoires and holidays. It means so much. But I always felt like a little bit of a deer in headlights. Like, what do people want from this book? I don't know. Is it supposed to be this? How is it? And I was very, you know, I guess I was just learning a new skill in a way. Um, and with this one, I felt like I finally realized that what I wanted each recipe to be in a very clear way. And it made it a lot easier to figure out what went in the book and what didn't, what's a keeper, what's not. And so how do you define a keeper? I want a keeper to be the last version of that recipe I think you'll ever eat. I think of us, I don't, maybe not everybody feels this way, but I always feel like I'm on a hunt. The best chocolate pudding, the best pound cake, the best chicken part. Like I want the, la I don't want to think about it. I want the last <laughs> recipe I'm going to need. I want the one, and I don't just mean that it comes out well, because I feel like a lot of cookbooks and a lot of chefs, like we talk about the perfect recipe, and it's about the taste, but we don't talk a lot about like, the experience of making it. Like, how many bowls did you dirty? And how many trips yeah. did you have to make? How many days did I miss? If you hated the process and every dish in your kitchen is dirty, like, you're not going to make it again. And I want us to actually enjoy this. So that, so that, what, that pound cake is one bowl. <laughs> so are the molasses spice cookies that I worked there were more batches. How many batches of those cookies did I make? Like everyone's like, stop it, we need those cookies. I was throwing them off our balcony because it was the COVID winter. Um, down to friends. <laughs> How many stories was that? So it's we're only on the second floor, so oh, it's okay. too bad. Um, but my aim is horrendous, so <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> no one to wait. None went to waste. I've heard that you test recipes for years sometimes. I mean, you guys think about that. That blows my mind. Can you walk us through yeah. when you're testing something for years? What does that mean? Let me, it's not like I start one year and I work on it every day for the next four years. It's more that if I'm not happy, I just table it. I just try to take a lot of notes. So I have long tried to get what I consider the perfect thick, plush molasses cookie that was like that, you know, the kind of mixture house all like the holidays and has perfectly balanced and I wanted it to be pillowy but not cakey and I wanted it to be like thick but not like uh, too crunchy and I, so I had like I really wanted it a certain way and when it wasn't that way but I was close I would just take a lot of notes and then just take a break from it and come back to it. So if I'm if I want to go back to my pound cake document, you know, I will find versions that didn't work. <laughs> and generally, I hated this. I can't do this anymore. I need to try something, and I try to leave myself good notes so when I'm in the mood to get back to it, I can kind of pick up where I left off. 
Deb keeps talking about the pound cake. <laughs> so I made it on the rainy Sunday. And I said, my family was like, we're having tea and pound cake at 3 o'clock. And what's going on? Yes, you are. And it's the only pound cake you'll ever need. It's so good. I'm so glad you like it. <laughs> we loved it. Um, the other thing that really strikes me about this book, and I know you did it in your previous ones, but perhaps it's the mindset I'm in. I love the storytelling in this book. Like Deb's writing, again, you all know this, but it's really good. Which, you know, some cookbooks, the, the, the recipes are really good. Of course you expect that. And you say, okay, this is a book that I'm gonna you know, go to. But not only are the recipes sort of foolproof, but it seems to me you're taking, if you're not taking joy in the writing, you're doing a really good job of masking that. Can you talk <laughs> us through your writing process a little bit? I love the writing process, actually. I mean, well, maybe perhaps not every minute, and no minutes of the editing process do I enjoy. <laughs> and especially not copy edits. Everything is actually fine. Copy edits is like, <sighs> it's really hard. It's really, it's like on page two, you can really do 76, 25, and 42. You said that this was two and a half grams, but here you're saying it's this we just correct, please. <laughs> and now picture that in the margin of every page about five times. It's unreal. It's unreal. And your copy of the worst. Um, but probably good for everybody in the long run that we get through them. Uh, I understand why they're needed. Um, I like writing. And I also like, as you can tell, I like talk. I think that the story behind the recipe matters. I know there's all this, like, uh, the head notes and, like, you know, get to the recipe. But I think it really matters. Like, why you made it this way? Why this recipe? Why now? How does it fit into your life? How is it relevant? What didn't work? What did work? How did you get there? Why is there only one egg yolk in the molasses cookie and not a whole egg? This matters. So I like to, I think these things matter and I want to know. And the reason is that if you put a whole egg in, it does work, but you get a foot and I wanted it to look like a pillow. And you only get the like sort of pillowy edge like tucked under if you just do the egg yolk. And, and I can assure you that I tried it both ways. I can also tell you that I tried, I did the pound cake, it uses melted butter, and, and you should not use softened butter. The pound cake will be too puffy, it gets too fluffy, it's not right. I think pound cake should have a density to it, and you will not get it from softened butter. Don't, isn't this relevant? Yeah. <laughs> That's why we have headphones. <laughs> well, I also found that very reassuring as a cook when I was making that pound cake. You know, sometimes I might take some shortcuts, you know, maybe I leave the butter out or whatever. And you were very clear and directed. It was like, you are going to do it this way. And here's why, which is nice, because otherwise you might say, it doesn't really matter. You know? The texture won't be as special, and also you'll be cleaning out the bottom of your eyes because it'll overflow. And you know that I know I just have from experience. <laughs> I did read somewhere, you can't stand mediocrity. Is that, you know, so it's like... In I, myself. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being like, I just, I just, I can't, I don't, there's enough recipes on the internet and there's enough cookbooks on this earth, so I just don't understand why I would publish it if I didn't feel like this was the actual one. Like, why, this has to be the actual, I'm not saying I may never meet another pound cake in my life that could be the one, but for this <gasps> purpose, I feel like I am there and I am there for the good hereafter, like I'm happy with this one. So um, can't make future promises, but I think that uh, there's enough recipes out there, so I don't know why I would publish one that didn't feel like worth adding to the Morris for. So we're gonna play a little game, which is I'm gonna say the name of a recipe and then you're gonna talk about it, which is <laughs> fun for all of us. Um, let's start with this cover recipe. I didn't know I was gonna have a mic, so excuse me if I drop the book on my foot. Um, this cover recipe, Told you, Louise and I made this weekend. It's delicious. <laughs> Please tell our audience what it is and why they must make it. Okay, how far back can I go? <laughs> you guys know in the 1990s. <laughs> in the heyday of roasted garlic, like all the fancy restaurants would have a head of roasted garlic on the table. And, and you would always roast it. People love garlic roasters for each other's host yes. gifts. Yes. Yes. And very quirky and ceramic. My mom's so hot. It's lovely. Yeah. yeah. So you would wrap it in foil and you would use a little drizzle of olive oil because these were like fat phobic times. And so, and you'd roast it. And I was just like, why are we using a drizzle of olive oil if we could be using a drizzle of butter? And if why are you using a drizzle of butter? We could use a whole stick of butter. <laughs> so, so I started making this roasted garlic butter, and we had like a New Year's Eve party, it was definitely pre COVID, so probably 2019. And we had this like 
whipped garlic butter crostini and it was i mean i made all of this other food that night and like only a, only thing people were talking about <laughs> was this garlic butter but the problem is i just then it just sat it sat in a document for a couple of years trying to figure out how am i going to use this it's i'm not i'm not doing a crostini recipe like it's so a crostini <laughs> recipe that takes an hour of roasting and then chilling time like that's just <laughs> For what, for a toast? Like, that's crazy. <laughs> so I just wanted to figure out how we could have this amazing flavor more often in our life, and that really just came with what happens if I throw a whole bag of ingredients with it. And now we have pasta sauce, and now we can have it on a Monday and a Tuesday. And I love how green it is. Green is my favorite color, so I'm so happy to have that on the cover. And my daughter, who eats nothing and she hates my food, she loves this recipe. <laughs> That's actually why it's in the cover. <laughs> it's the only thing she eats. <laughs> well, my daughters also love the recipe and they finish the pot in a day and ask mm -hmm. for it every week. It also reheats really well. Not all does. pastas really yeah. do, but this one really reheats. They well. took it to school for lunch school. the next day, so it's just a little, you know, thermos. So it's cool. I'm sorry, was I supposed to give like a quick explanation? No, 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 no. We're taking a little, uh, you know, leisurely stroll through the book here. Um, breakfast potato chips and sheet pan eggs, please. <laughs> All right, so I do understand that this sound of sheep pan eggs is not really that appealing. Like, it sounds very gimmicky, and it's not something I would, I think a fried egg is definitely the way to go. But I have made, if we want to have a savory breakfast, potatoes every kind of way for breakfast. I've done them diced like home fries, I've done them grated, like latkes or roasty. I've done basically every single kind. And shockingly, the days that I cut it really thin and I roast them, so they're like oven potato chips, is the most popular. I mean, shockingly, everybody chooses the potato chip morning over the, you know, cubes of spice or whatever potatoes. And so it really is just as simple as cutting a potato thin, seasoning it all, we use some onion powder, and I use some smoked paprika, and you roast it on a baking sheet. But since you're already in the oven, you might as well, if you would like, add to, I basically make little nests, um, just make a couple holes in the potato chips after they're mostly done, and drop an egg. And what I love is when the egg comes off the baking sheet, you have this, like, lion's mane of potato chips kind of stuck to it and then you scoop, use those to scoop the egg so it all just kind of works out and it's like a 15 minute break it's really quick because they're going to roast really fast yeah i'm very excited about that one um i would like to ask you i've not made this yet but i read your recipe about the, with the polenta and the garlicky kale and we as we talked about i have a vegetarian in my household and polenta is a big meal for us Really, if you put it in the oven during this, I'm not going to get lumps? Not going to get lumps. Right. She says you can put it in the oven and get creamy polenta. Everybody's been lying to you. <laughs> Please tell us why that is. Put it in the oven. I don't know. I don't know. I can't tell you why it is. I can just tell you that you can bake it in the oven. You do stir it at the end for a minute, mm -hmm. but you can just... I got really into this. Like I mentioned it in the kind of this idea of just throwing everything in the oven. Like, what can... And it's different dishes. But how can I make a full meal? If I'm using the oven for one thing, I don't want to use, I don't want to saute the grease on the stove. Mm -hmm. And if I'm going to have, you know, or if I'm going to use the stove, I don't want to roast the vegetables. So I'm trying to have everything, everything in the oven at the same time, at the same temperature for, you know, maybe one comes out a little bit sooner. So that was basically it. So we've got one pan with the black pepper and pecorino, um, Polenta, and then the other pan is doing this kind of braised garlicky kale, and I love the combination together. It's also really good with the meatballs, for the spaghetti and meatballs, if you don't want to do the pasta or with the pasta, but I just, I think it's just a perfect combination. Mm -hmm. right, one more recipe, and then, let me just read, I'm just going to read a couple things in case you haven't opened your book. Clam chowder with bacon croutons, yes. Um, <laughs> chard salt and vinegar cabbage, yes. Deli pickle potato salad. I love that. <laughs> right? Yes. Pickles instead of like whatever else, just cuts. Yes. It's delicious. It's really good. <laughs> it's, it's an all season potato salad. Um, the one, the other one I'd love to talk about is the ginger garlic chicken noodles. I feel like everyone I know is a sick person in their household right now. <laughs> I mean, the new, I'm not saying I do. <laughs> no, that's fine, fine too. We're good. Um, but why this chicken soup recipe? Because I feel like a lot of people might need that in the next month. 
So in my last book, I do a very like long cook with the grandma style chicken noodle soup. It's not difficult, but that's like the classic boiled chicken, pick the carcass, like it's the whole thing. This is not that at all. One of the things I started playing around with over our many, many months of home cooking, many, 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 many meals a day in Melt, um, was that I could actually make a really solid chicken noodle soup with just poaching chicken thighs in even just seasoned well, but not even always broth. You could get a lot of flavor out of it. Again, it's not going to have the same depth as a multi-hour, you know, bone broth, but for like a weeknight where you want to have chicken noodle soup, it's pretty amazing. And from there, I just love playing around with it. And this basically takes, I basically do it with what I call dumpling dipping sauce, which is not the official you know, name of the sauce. But you basically um, you add a little bit of ginger and garlic to the broth. And we have scallions in there. There's a little bit of julienne carrot, but it's very simple. I like to use a nice curly ramen noodle just because it's fun. Mm -hmm. And then at the very end, and this is very kidding me, you don't cook it in because it gets lost. Do a mixture of um, sesame oil, chili crisp, some black vinegar. If you can find it, otherwise regular rice vinegar is fine. But black vinegar is worth buying. It's like two dollars and fifty cents a bottle, and it's really good. Um, and some soy sauce, and you pour this in at the very end, and you get this sort of like hot sour flavor, um, but also this dynamic richness to it. And I think that's just very key. So the whole thing to me is just a very simple soup that just tastes like something you want. Ready for it. Um, I'm just going to give the audience a heads up. I have been given strict instructions. Deb is going to personalize after the event. So we're, I'm going to keep us on task. And I also can tell from this room we have a lot of questions. We're going to have a lot of questions. Um, so I'm going to go through a series of some rapid fire questions and then we're going to open it up um, so that hopefully most of you who have questions get a chance to chat with Deb. Um, all right, my first question is inspired because I noticed you gave a few specific product or you know recommendations in the front, one of which is salt. And not to make it about me, but you are one of many chefs who's, who recommend diamond over the kosher salt, right? Is that correct? Yes. Ish. Oh, please <laughs> hold on, go ahead. I do Give not think you need to find diamond salt if your store doesn't have it. There's no reason to be more for it. What I think it's worth knowing is that most people developing your recipes use it, so I do too. Um, and I just wanted to walk you through how to swap if you're using another brand, that's all. Otherwise, the salt is off in every recipe. It's ridiculous that we have this problem where every brand of kosher salt weighs something different, but if you use a teaspoon of something else, it'll come out much saltier. But no, I don't actually think it matters what you use. You should use whatever you can get, whatever makes you happy. So I mean, the price is getting kind of crazy even at my local store. Really? I don't know, it's like, well, shipping supplies, I guess. So. Um, but no, use whatever you can, but I want to walk you through it rather than having to have very long salt directions in each recipe. Well, again, I think this is why we trust death. It's like such a small sentence in the beginning. I was like, aha, this is why. You know? No sentence has been more labor. We've been read that like 72 times. <laughs> I was, we have to make it sound less scary. <laughs> um, on the product front, neutral oil is something I struggle with a lot in my kitchen because it'll say, you know, use whatever neutral oil you have. What is your preferred neutral and does it change from cooking like you know frying something up in a pan versus baking or does, does it really not matter i would say it depends on what i'm making but yeah. i think it's just useful to have i think it's something we've always had we've always considered oil neutral and then all of a sudden we started using like olive oil and this kind of oil but no it really is just anything with, without a particular flavor and i think a lot of times we're using olive oil but we may not want the olive oil flavor in something or you might be using coconut oil and you don't want the coconut oil flavor but hey you're, you could use safflower oil you could use sunflower oil you could use grape grape seed oil is a big one you could use an avocado oil that's good for high heat you can use robust and vegetable oil it's fine just any kind of basic oil what do you stop I have all of those things. <laughs> but in terms of quantity, if I'm frying, I'm using like the Wesson bottle. I'm not using something fancy. Okay. Wesson. Or Frisco or whatever. Um, all right, a little a little more rapid. I hear you don't eat much breakfast, but if you did, what's your favorite breakfast food? I'm sorry, that's not a recipe in the book. <laughs> no, it does not have to be a recipe. Baguette, butter jam. I love that. 
Uh, we're in a library. What is a book you have recently read or you've been on book tour, so maybe not reading so many books that you look forward to when you have a break from your book tour? Why did I, I actually just started Emma Straub's new book and it's wonderful. It's about dogs. <laughs> it's really wonderful. Oh, it's, um, it's called, this uh, thank, you. Tomorrow. thank you, this yes. time tomorrow. It's such a beautiful title. So I'm a couple chapters in and then I got a little busy. She was here. She in uh, June talking about it. Oh, she, it's great. It's a wonderful book. That's a great book. That's a great book for holiday, like great reading. I have a lot of books on my nightstand yeah, that are waiting for me to read them. Um, what books. other cookbooks are you excited about this season? Not that anyone's buying any other cookbook except yours. <laughs> but if they were, this is such a good year for cookbooks. Yeah. I love Claire Saffitz's new book. I love the Walks of Life cookbook. I love Frankie Gauze Taiwanese. Um, a bit, um, it's a uh, yeah, what's the name of First Generation. It's called, but it's Taiwanese American food, and he has these beautiful ducklings. Um, hmm. What else? There's um, there's so many good books out right now. I'm, like, I'm blanking. I love uh, Eric Kim's uh, Korean cookbook. I love, I mean, that was from the spring. Yeah, but, Korean American. Yeah, yeah, Korean American. I feel like there's so much good stuff out right now. There's so many good cookbooks. If you happened to be alone in your apartment without your family and you were cooking yourself dinner, what would you make yourself? I want to make something. I mentioned this earlier. Um, of course, I'm going to mess up in the title. I'm sorry. Um, it's Mexical Salad. Um, I'm going to watch it too. But it's beautiful. It's a white cover with a hot pink. Eye it's eye. really great, and it's from one of the. Tell me your name again, because I'm forgetting. I'm looking. It's um, Rosanna's going to get sorry. that in one um, minute. I literally was looking through. <laughs> I follow. It's Ix, Ixta Belfridge, I think. Yes. Is it? Yeah. So I follow her, and it's, yes. I yes. love her cooking. She came out of the Autolanki test kitchen, so you know there's like just creativity, like coming through the pores. And I was flipping through her book when I was in Toronto last week before I got taken down um, <laughs> by germs <laughs> um, and I was looking through it and I wanted to make every single thing in the book I didn't want to have to explain it to anyone in my family what was in it everything looks so good it's so creative what is the one thing you have no interest in learning to make because you can just I mean, you live in New York that you can just get and you say forget it I do not desire to make sushi and I do not desire to make croissants. I've done both, but I do not need to. No. <laughs> Although I will say the falafel recipe in your book looks amazing. But that is worth it. I okay. know it sounds so easy, but it's totally worth it. I know, I know it involves trying, but everything else is so simple. And it is it is the original vegan dinner party. It, it yeah. is vegan. Yeah. It's vegan and it's so good. And it really tastes as good, if not better, than it's incredible. You can pull it off the home. It looks great. I'm definitely adding it to my. Um, okay, favorite cocktail? Olivardier. Yes. Maybe a little nod for the apple cider old fashioned there. It's earlier in the season. And that's on the TikTok. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's on the TikTok. It smells so good when you make that. Right next to the apple cheddar crisp kale salad, which is amazing. <laughs> Talk about something that sat around for years before I figured out what to do with that recipe. I've been putting cheddar crisp and cheese crisps on so many different salads. I just couldn't figure out how to like which which was the one. And I was like, this is the one. I don't know why. It just it takes me years. You need another kale salad. I know you think you don't, but you do. <laughs> this one. Um, all right. We're going to do some questions from people who have so kindly joined us tonight. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. And are we doing roaming mics or we're just going to have them stand and shout it out? Okay. Yes. Um, so I am a very intuitive cook and I don't like to measure things. But I always, um, I always want to be, I always have a food blog website that I pay for the domain, but I don't want to make the recipes. So, I know, it's very contradictory, but well, how do you, do you enjoy measuring every little thing out and making the note on you change a teaspoon to a tablespoon? Do you enjoy that process? <coughs> Yes, I do. Yes. <laughs> no, I think some people are from the hip cooks and they don't like to measure it, and I think that's fine. That's just not the kind of cook I am. I really want things to be exactly the way I like them, and I don't want to do all of that work to get the salt and the sugar and the cooking time right to like maybe get it kind of right the next time. Like that'll drive me crazy. If I did all that work, I want it exactly. This. And I had never really thought this. 
thought about it that much until I saw the 60 Minutes interview with Ida Gardner recently. Yeah. Yeah. She said the same thing, and I was like, oh, I've never heard that outside my own head. <laughs> 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 she will sit down and she makes her recipes to the letter because she's gone through all this work to get it exactly right. And so for me, it's that. So I'm, because I'll be like, oh, I have this great pound cake recipe, and then it'll be like an okay pound cake. No, I want it to be that one. So for me, I'm very much a recipe cook and I want to make that. That's it. If I'm just making dinner and I just playing around, it may not be. But if I'm, if I've gotten that recipe right, I want to use that recipe. Yes. Yes. Um, so I am obsessed with your weekly whiteboard uh, <laughs> menu, and I'm wondering if you are you planning it in advance, or is like Monday? This is what I made. Okay. It's a report card, not a plan. I am not. <laughs> it's more like this is how it went. Like at the end of the day, I'll write. Once in a while, I'll be like, we're definitely doing this on Thursday, and that will guarantee that it will not happen on Thursday. <laughs> but sometimes in my head, I have some ideas, but it's yeah, it's very much a report card. I think it's more just like this is how the week went, and it was supposed to be basically blank for the next few weeks as I'm traveling, but since I was home, we have a very full menu board. <laughs> you can tell I was well and getting bored because I started making dinner again. <laughs> Next question. Yes, I know. Um, for, unfortunately, I am not very, and the one thing that I can't find for your face for is heavy screen, like mm -hmm. that I will from another I'm already eyeballing. <laughs> have you ever found anything that's a good I should say that I haven't done enough looking. <laughs> I could ask my sister who doesn't eat dairy, you know, and she could probably tell me which ones are her favorite. I know Trader Joe's has some great ones. You know, coconut milk is really like the go-to that people recommend, you can buy coconut creamer, but it may not be the flavor that you want in your clam chowder. I mean, there's something like, you know, so it's just about finding the right one. There's gotta be a more neutral one that exists. And maybe it's just as simple as like a more neutral coffee creamer that doesn't you add it at the end. Yes, right. So I have a question. Is there such a thing as an amateur recipe tester? Do you use them? And then <laughs> how does one get involved in that? <laughs> in fact, you're all the recipe testers. I hope you let me know if this book works. <laughs> Please let me know if these recipes don't work. Um, so I'm, I've kind of gone all over the place with recipe testing. For my site, I just do it myself, right. and I always have. For my first book, I hired outside recipe testers. For the second book, I hired outside recipe testers. Both times they were, for the first two books, they were people who either lived, they lived elsewhere or they worked elsewhere. And so I wasn't getting to try the food as it was made. Yeah. And for this book, I had a very, I decided I did not want to hire anybody who could not bring me a sample of the recipe, which basically limited to the blocks around my apartment. I was very lucky <laughs> to find a person who lived a couple blocks or that didn't mind like swinging stuff by, or you, know, you could freeze it and I could try the stuff once a month or whatever, but I, I, can't, I can't go from notes. I can't trust that your notes are like good enough. So the answer is, so that was what I did for this book and I still was very happy. Okay. Not with the quality, just like I realized that I want somebody in my kitchen to test it. So I think that the answer is I don't, I think that for now, on, I don't know how I'm going to work this out because my kitchen is not very big, uh, but we'll see. But I think I just feel better if somebody's making it in front of me and I see it and I taste it and I see exactly what's happening. I think that, because it, it costs the recipe testers make a lot of money <laughs> um, as they should it's a lot of work and I spend a lot of money on recipe testing so to feel like I'm not completely satisfied with the process is something I have to work on an adjustment <laughs> but there are times for example when I was making my ginger cookies 92 times one December where I was just sending it to the friends and saying yeah let me know how it goes but I would not that would not be the final I would not put it in the book just because Diego said it came out well. That's not that <laughs> not suspicious. But like, could he recreate it? Could he recreate the like? I gave him the recipe. Uh, his came out a little different, and I got really stressed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's fine now, I think. <laughs> he also did the pound cake. <laughs> yeah, so I'll send it to people.
people, you know, to try. Um, but it won't be like the uh, the recipe test that makes the book. Yes, right here. Yeah. Hi. Um, as someone who loves to cook, do you find the holidays stressful because you feel pressure from the family because everyone's like, oh my God, you make the best bread, you make the best this, you make the best that? Or do you find it to be like a fun showcase where like, this is great, I get to spend all day in the kitchen? <laughs> so I think this actually has a little bit to do with cooking and I think it has a lot to do with hosting. So I think, so my theory, and I think, I think about this every Thanksgiving, the world is divided between the people who host and the people who make the turkey. So <laughs> the <private> plates. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And the people who show up. <laughs> I have a small apartment. I show up elsewhere. <laughs> I to have Thanksgiving in my apartment. So I can go make my favorite baked goods, bring the warm dinner rolls and whatever. So I love it. But I'm not like a turkey duty every year, although now I kind of am because my mother in law's been making my turkey recipe. And she said, Can you go in the kitchen carpet? And also, could you finish your stuffing? <laughs> so it's happening. So I was going to say, I think the people who, for, for people who host, it's, it's just an absolutely tremendous amount of work to do year after year. And I see some of you nodding, you know. And I think that it would be very easy to get burnt out on that. But in terms of, do I get tired of the recipes? No, I love them. It's so fun for me. <laughs> Can I put you back on that and ask, um, in this book, we have a few holidays, Hanukkah mm -hmm. and Christmas and New Year's coming up. Are there any in this book that you would recommend people look at for those that upcoming trifecta? Absolutely. So there's like, you should definitely make, if you're showing up, it's like a wine and cheese kind of thing. You should make the wheat and green gala. People will be very happy. It's like very decadent. It goes really well. That kind of, it also would go well with a cookie party because I think these will appreciate something savory in the salad too yes. for balance. So I think that's a really nice one. It reheats really well. You can even make it a couple days in advance. It's also good at room temperature. But I also think it's really nice to have like some dinner party foods that aren't too fancy. And for that, I love the pot roast in there. I think that'd be really nice for holidays. As I said, I think the falafel is a little more of an undertaking, but not is the perfect, even if you're not vegan at a dinner party, it's just so fun and everyone can kind of assemble their own pitas. There is a fettuccine, um, with white rice. Ew, it that looks so good. I'm sorry, I have I should not tell this joke, but every time I would type it, my computer would change it to white rage. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like anyway, that she doesn't want to wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> This is, I have a long history with this dish where we had this friend from Paris who doesn't live here anymore, but we're going to get her back one day. Um, and she, many, many years ago, invited us over for dinner parties, like many, many, many years ago, and she made tart de flat, which is just, she's like, oh, it's just, it's just, it's a simple student meal, you know? <laughs> we're like, what's in it? It's like two pounds of creme fraiche, two pounds of cheese, and like eight potatoes. <laughs> it was insane, and she did it with, we had a lot of white wine and some green salad, and I've been trying to sort of recreate it since, um, but the cheese that's typically used replichon is very hard to get here and very expensive, and I finally realized that her clut was close and actually fairly inexpensive. It actually costs less than Parmesan. Um, so it's very accessible and you can really get it. So I started making it with that. And then it became, I make basically two pans usually for every New Year's Eve. 
and it does have bacon in it, but if you're vegetarian, I made one for somebody's boyfriend who doesn't eat meat last year with just um, sauteed yeah. mushrooms between the layers instead of the bacon, and you're not going to miss a thing. I think I put that note in. Um, but it's really fun to end the year with this incredibly decadent, I don't know, it, and it's not, it's actually not that creamy, and it's also not a French dish. It's from the Alps. It's like something you would have at a ski lodge in the Alps. Like, I've never been, so I'm going to have to just imagine, but it's really fun in the so it's, uh, so it's potatoes and onion and bacon and a little bit of cream and a lot of cheese all melted together, and it's so good with a green salad. It's, it's just the perfect New Year's Eve dish. Sheer decadence. See, you know, writing, I read that. You want to buy this book just to read it, but I read that last night and said, I am. And then you should make the dolce puddle, puddle cakes um, as dessert because you can kind of make them in advance and then just either bake them off right before or just kind of unmold them before you want them before. Love it. This is no holiday solves the food. <laughs> All right, more questions from the audience. Yes, right here. Yes. Um, I still have a small kitchen. Uh, I'm still downtown. I still have a small kitchen. I've moved within my building, but I haven't really moved. Um, so my apartment's still, the kitchen is still small. It has good light, which is all I really cared about, but... Um, I shop, I'm really lucky, I, you know, I have grocery stores all around and I can really get anything I need. It's very easy. We also have a really good grocery delivery service. So I've got that covered, but I try for the most part, like to not put anything in a recipe that my mother is going to yell at me that she can't get at the shop right by her in New Jersey. <laughs> tell me I can't get that at the shop right. And I just think that I don't, I mean, it's great that I can get everything, but I really like Raclette should be the most complicated thing, and also I think Trader Joe's has it. Like it's not, it shouldn't be difficult. There's harissa in the pot roast, but like this is not, I think, hard to get these days, and it's certainly worth getting. And of course, I mentioned the black vinegar, but I also have to tell you that it was like two dollars and eighty cents a bottle, you know. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I really, 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 I'm only going to call for an ingredient that's very specific if I think it makes a difference, and then I will also tell you whether you need it or not, and what to do if you don't have. I like I would like to embed one in a Manhattan apartment. Yeah. I cov I covet like I see you guys have all these counters. <laughs> I hear you don't have dishes in your living room, like that might be interesting. I've heard about it. So I covet I covet it, but I, I really just want to live where I do and that's that's basically the trade-off. And I think that I may not feel this way when I'm working on a cookbook shoot um, <laughs> for two weeks, but um, I think that can be good for the recipes in the long run because it's just anything more than two bowls is just not going to happen. I can't, it's just there's there's a real hard limit to what I can pull off in the kitchen and it gets very unpleasant and it's it's real like red light going off when I, when I'm, when I have more stuff than I can fit on my one tiny counter, so. All right. Yes. <laughs> This is kind of jumping off about recipe testing. How much stock do you put in comments on your website and on Instagram? I use your I make this tab mm -hmm. all the time for my own use of your recipes, mm -hmm. but I'm curious if that input has anything to do with how you do it. And also, do you cut your sandwiches differently now? <laughs> <laughs> Hearing how recipes are going, I take comments very seriously. I'm not going to think that a recipe is a disaster because it didn't work for one person, but I definitely pay attention to what happened. And you often will probably see me asking, like, tell me what happened. Like, where did the recipe hurt you? Like, <laughs> like, was it the parchment paper? Like, I'm definitely hearing about the parchment paper on the cheddar crisp for people. Like, well, I'm trying to suss out which brands suck and which ones don't, basically, because um, I do think it's like a parchment brand thing. I'm just trying to figure it out. I'm not. I'm not going to start recommending one brand now. Other, but I, I want I'm, I'm collecting data all the time <laughs> about recipes so I love reading comments I love hearing how they're going I want to hear if it's not going well um just don't leave a one star on Amazon 
Uh, Maybe hopefully there will be more reason to. No, well, yeah. Wait, do you need to do a review? I mean, okay, yeah, tell them what to do. So, <laughs> say what to do. <laughs> Like, why do you guys cut your sandwiches so weird? Everyone's like, you're doing it wrong. So what I do is for this kind of sandwich, I cut it this way. This kind of sandwich, I cut it this way. But I'm the weird one. <laughs> <laughs> My goal when cutting a sandwich is to have the smallest amount of gut, sandwich guts exposed as possible. It's always the shortest way across. If the bread's this way, it goes this way. We all know if it's a baguette, it goes this way. And if it's like an oval, it goes this way. But for some reason, with grilled cheese and stuff, you guys just like to have this like very, I just want it to be stable. To be the same. I mean, that said, I have found myself cutting them on the diagonal and I feel like yeah. I've been, I like, I, my husband says I'm giving up peer pressure. I don't, not the grilled cheese itself, but sometimes I'll just make like open paste sort of cheesy toast for a, um, for a soup night just to basically get my kids to eat it. And I find myself cutting it on the diagonal, and it's so weird. Rather than this way, because this looks no, pretty good no. to me. This is definitely, this is a, this was going to cause a, a new, a new way of the sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think about every time I make a sandwich. I, I've been it. I, I also love this kind of closed stakes drama. Like, I mean, we can talk about this forever. I love talking about it. And I also come out in this book against salad spinners, which was really enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Because now anybody who hasn't read that is in the nine tomorrow. Right? They take up too much space and they don't try the lettuce. Yeah. <laughs> I so do walk how you do you try your lettuce? I have, and first of all, I hope you guys all have, I'm a huge proponent of having a good kitchen towel. You've got like the cute, nice ones that are linen, and then you have like some workhorse ones, and those should be they should be black. I get mine from William Sonoma. This is not sponsored. I get them from William. They should be black and they should be thick and they should be large. And so because I am not getting some stain treating dishcloths. So you can like and I but if I see the stain, it looks you know gross. So I have a bunch of really large black towels and I just I'll wash the lettuce. I actually plunge it because you want to get the grits all at the bottom. And then I just kind of shake it out and I put it on one of these towels, lay it out one layer, and I loosely roll it up like a cigar and then you can either just leave it for a while if you're not going to use it till later or you can give it a like kind of hold it like like the ends of candy like kind of and then you just shake it out a little bit just a few shakes i have done this side by side with a with a salad spinner like we did this side by side and it came out so much more dry and at the end you just have a dish towel which is by the way it's just water you can use it again it's not dirty <laughs> so it's fine i love that it's not it's something i already have in my kitchen and i'm just it, it works really well and it's dry change okay <laughs> so mine was always like it always collects a lot of space it's a lot of crap and then you have to pull and then you if it came out dry it would be fine it wasn't coming out dry i still felt like i had to dry lettuce. Yeah. All right, I'm going to say we have two more questions, and then Deb's going to get a signing. Can I see a hand? Yes, this right here. I want to go back to what you were talking before about the difference between the egg yolk and whole egg. How do you know the difference? So you've made this cake, and you've put an entire egg in, and you're like, hmm, something's not right. How do you know to try it with just the yolk? <laughs> I just, I just, I, because I, 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 I try it both ways, <laughs> but I didn't, I, it's a cookie, so it's not uncommon for a cookie to just have like maybe a sable or certain kinds of shortbread, might just have an egg yolk in them for richness, so it wasn't completely off the path, but it was also a little bit of, I tried it a bunch of times and I couldn't get rid of that foot, and I didn't want the foot on the cookie, I had this vision in my head, so I probably tabled it for a while, and then one day I was like, man, I just just try the egg white, which is what I thought would be the success, and let me just try the egg yolk, and I basically went from there. But it was probably a big gap there where I was frustrated and I didn't like where it was coming out, and I just kind of tabled it for a while, and then I came back to it. So then I was like, aha, I have an idea, I'm gonna try this thing. So that was it. Um, but it doesn't always happen. That's why I have a lot of recipes I haven't finished. They're waiting for their aha moments, and they never come. <laughs> One more. Yes, right over here. Um, you mentioned a couple of times with the readers and a lot of us in the community. Do you find yourself having to make multiple sales 
my cooking so I think that helps because at any given point 75% of the family considers the recipe as <laughs> do you see how I spun that like I've done total PR for this so we have 25% who doesn't but she doesn't like anything like I can probably make the thing that she says she wants the most and she also won't eat it so I try to keep that from perspective no I try not to make multiple meals there are weeks where I'm just a little more just beaten down and I might just like start the week making a box of spiral pasta and tossing with butter and have it in the fridge and I can always scoop some of that in a bowl and maybe it'll make it a little easier for her to try the other things at the table or she just doesn't try them. But I think it's easier for me to stand my ground just because other people are eating it and appreciate it. But this really unraveled last summer when her brother was at summer camp and she wasn't and I absolutely lost my cooking energy like I could not I couldn't bring myself to cook things for the child ch like I'm not going to make this effort for her it was just my husband we probably just go out or like making a crazy salad you know, like, it's summer I don't really so I really and that was when I um I wrote about it on the site I call I call it buttered noodles for Francis because I basically just decided to make buttered noodles every day and see how long it would take for her to try her buttered noodles and that day did not come. <laughs> but her brother came back from camp and I started making another food again. <laughs> the other reason I am semi tolerant of the buttered noodles is that she actually does like vegetables if she likes salad. Um, and I think because I can put out like a plate of carrots and cucumbers and tomatoes when she's asking for dinner like to kind of <coughs> slide it in next to her and then I'll come back that face empty I'm like okay let's get some noodles for you it's, it's fine um but we don't do it all the time just you know having a moment <laughs> so I want to before getting to the gratitude just say Deb is going to stay and personalize all of the books are signed so if you just want to purchase signed copies you may have done that on the way in or you can do that on the way out if you would like a note to a special someone, um, Deb will be delighted to do that for you. And so if you'll let her exit before you all stand, that would be fabulous. Deb, thank you. This was such a pleasure.